Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. I say that all year round and I get funny looks, so this is the one time of year where I'm not weird. Um, I know you can laugh at that. Um, give me a minute here because my uh, notes once again have signed me out, but that's okay because uh, I'm going to update you on the ministry partner forum that's coming December 11th. Nils mentioned that and uh, he talked through the details of needing your input on our budget. We uh, have that budget available for you in printed copy in the Connecting Center, uh, and then we will send out an email with that budget as well, so you can look it over and be prepared next week to ask any questions. Um, we can hopefully have a nice productive time next week during the Sunday School Hour to answer your questions and uh, show you what's going on. Um, and then we won't vote on it until later in December. Now, the other thing, is parents, there will not be uh, the Calvary Kids program during that time. However, the nursery will be open for you to be able to go back there, watch your kids, and we are going to live stream um, that ministry partner forum with elders in the nursery so that as you watch it from the nursery, um, you will be able to ask questions directly to an elder, and we will kind of have a, um, a parent version of that ministry partner, partner forum while you're connected to the main ministry partner forum. So if all of that makes sense, then uh, please be here next Sunday morning during our Sunday school time. All right, I'm in the final stages of signing into my account yet again, um, but I would like you to turn to Luke chapter 1, if you wouldn't mind. We're going to read a few verses from Luke chapter 1. But before we do that, I just want to refresh you in um, the miracle that is life. I think after last week, um, I was reflecting this week as I prepared, and I was a little bit overwhelmed with the idea of human life and just how precious it really is. Um, I know many of you hold that same view but just the miracle of birth is just amazing. And last week as we talked about the virgin birth, uh, I just kept being overwhelmed by how special life is. But this is a strange thing because one of the most frustrating things in life is other people, right? One of the greatest things is other people, but one of the most frustrating things is other people. And I know for myself I need to do a better job at always looking at how wonderful God's gift of life is in you and in you and in you and me, right? And I want you to focus, and if you're looking at your notes, you can see that the very first thing I want you to see is the miracle of life. We need to be refreshed in that. Um, it's easy to forget how miraculous life is. So in its basic understanding of what life is, it is the detail and the care and the love and the intimacy that God gave us. It should leave us in awe because God is on display in his creation and in each and every one of you. Mankind is a wonderful image of God. And we could be refreshed by what a great designer and creator we have. So thinking back to Luke chapter 1, we see a barren woman give birth. What a miracle of God. We see a virgin conceive, and that's a miracle of God. But there's one other element to that. You see, Jesus was an extraordinary miracle. You see, for a virgin to conceive is one thing, that's a miracle. But this virgin conceived the Son of God, not of her own doing. This was the doing of the Holy Spirit. But she carried the Son of God, and that's extraordinary. There has been no man or woman's birth or conception that has mattered more to the world and to mankind than the birth of Jesus Christ. No birthday has ever been as widely celebrated or recognized or honored as much as the birth of Jesus. And the reason for that is because he is not just another baby. He is not just a man that had some miracles surrounding him. You see, 1 Timothy 3.16 tells us this. He was manifested in the flesh. And this is why we celebrate. This is why it matters. This is why Christmas is so great because we're not just celebrating someone else's birthday. 
We're celebrating the birth of God in flesh in Jesus Christ. I want to read to you from Luke chapter 1. We read this same passage last week. I want to read to you just a few verses because last week we started reading and then we paused so that we could dive a little bit deeper into the virgin birth. And now today we're going to read a little bit further and we're going to pause and we're going to look at Jesus' divinity, how he is God. So Luke chapter 1, we're going to read starting in verse 32. And we're going to go to verse 37. If you're able to stand while we read God's word, um, that would be a great show of honor and respect for the holy word of God. Luke 1, 32. This is the angel speaking to Mary. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren for nothing will be impossible with God. You may be seated. So, Michael, I did jump ahead on my screens during that time, so I am a little bit further, so hopefully you can find out where I am. But one of the things that interests me is rereading all of these familiar stories that we are all so well aware of and asking myself strange questions so that I can better understand these stories. And one of the big confusions about uh, the Christmas story, if you want to call it a story, um, is how do we have Jesus who is both fully God and fully man? And then there's other things that surround it, like the virgin birth, which we talked about last week. We have these weird individuals later that bring gifts to Jesus that make no sense for a baby to receive all of these weird, strange gifts. And so I always like to look back and say, how do we better understand what that really means? And so the next three weeks, we are going to very briefly look at the gifts of the wise men, but not to study those gifts, but to show us who Jesus Christ truly is. You see, the wise men showed up months, maybe years later. They were not part of your nativity. So if you have a nativity scene in your house with the wise men, put them across the room somewhere else so that they're on a journey to come and see Jesus later. But they brought gifts to Jesus. And scripture doesn't tell us exactly that the wise men brought these gifts with a very particular symbolism to represent this aspect of Jesus. They brought gifts. And the gifts that they brought, as unfamiliar as we are with some of them, they were a common gift to bring and to present to people during that time. We don't know if the wise men gave them with the intention of recognizing things like Jesus' divinity, but there is some symbolism there that we can see. So we're not going to study the gifts, but we are going to see three aspects of Jesus over the coming weeks. Today, that Jesus is God. We're going to see his divinity. We're going to see that Jesus is king. So we're going to study Jesus' royalty. And then we're going to study Jesus' sacrifice. So the gifts the wise men brought had value, had meaning, and that is the purpose of giving a gift. The reason that we give a gift is to show the person that we love them. What we're saying is the money that I used for this gift or the gift itself, it has value, it, it means something to me, but it doesn't mean as much to me as you do. That's the point of a gift. You're giving it to them and saying, I want to give this to you as a sacrifice of myself because you mean that much to me. It is basically saying, I love you. Some of you know that you give gifts as your expression of love, but that is the intent to say, I love you more than whatever I have right here. So these gifts did have meaning. John Piper says this about gifts. We draw near to Christ because of who he is, not because of what we get. 
were saying to him, you are my treasure, not these things. And so the symbolism in gift giving, and we can see it with the wise men, is they brought something that meant something and said, you are my treasure, not these items. Now, of course, there's some comedy surrounding the wise men because were they there, were they not, how long was their journey? journey? And you might ask, what prompted the gifts of the wise men? Why would they bring those items? Well, this might help you see why they brought those items. That little sign there says customers who bought this also bought. And you guys can be familiar with that because you know with your shopping, you're going to go on Amazon later today and look for Christmas presents and there's going to be all these suggestions of what gifts to buy. They were probably just shopping for gold and then this shop owner said, oh, but guess what? Other people also were interested in this and thus we have the three gifts, right? But we also know that these men were supposed to be wise this next one will show you that maybe not all of them were as wise as we thought. It says, I thought you were wise. I thought you were a wise man. It's supposed to be frankincense. <laughs> Classic joke, right? Frankenstein, okay? But you may wonder, what is frankincense? And that's what we're going to talk about briefly today. Well, frankincense is a glittery, fragrant gum from eastern trees that hardens into a resin, and they used it for burning. It actually is considered the finest incense in the world. So if you break that word apart, the last part says incense. It just happens to be frank at the beginning. But it's the finest incense in the world. The name actually means pure incense. It was used in Exodus chapter 30 in the tent of meeting as an incense, and it's treated like anointing oil. So, because of its exalted treatment and its use in worship and in offerings, it can be said that it would symbolize the divinity of Jesus because God is worthy of worship. And now we have God in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, who is also worthy to be worshiped. So you can draw that correlation. We see that in the verse that we read in Luke 1.32, where it says, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. That word great means esteemed highly due to importance and excellence. And it means splendid on a grand scale. He will be great. He will be the son of the most high. Today, I'm going to move through some of the key elements of who Jesus is. It will probably be a refreshment for some of you to know who Jesus is and to be reminded of that. I want to refresh you in what Calvary's statement on Jesus is, and this comes right from our Constitution. We believe in the absolute deity of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was divine as no other man can be, being total man and total God, existing from all eternity, co-equally with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and that he is the creator and sustainer of all things, that he never ceases to be God for one instant, and that his humiliation did not consist in laying aside his deity, that as a man he was miraculously begotten of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin, sinless in his life, ministering often with miracles, making atonement for the sins of the world by his death, bodily resurrection, and ascension. That's who Jesus Christ is. That's who we celebrate as laying in a manger. That's who we worship in our lives because he is our savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 2, 6 through 8 says this, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, it can be so easy to get caught up in celebrating a birthday. And we think of celebrating the birthday of a baby, how sweet, but we forget that this baby is God in the flesh. And that brings with it impact. It brings meaning. It brings something that we can't ignore in our daily life. And from that verse, we see that he did not count equality with God. So he owned that equality with God, but he didn't count that to just be something that he sat in. He said, no, I'm loving and I need to do something about this problem that man has. And so he became obedient in the form of a servant. A.W. Tozer puts it this way about that hypostatic union, the personal 
union of two different natures. He says this, Jesus veiled his deity. He did not void his deity. And Wayne Grudem says this, Jesus added humanity without surrendering deity. You see, both of them can exist in their fullness. And so what I want you to see today is a few things about Jesus. The very first one is that Jesus is fully God. Colossians 2.9 says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. It says fullness of deity, not in part. Jesus is God. And Hebrews 1.8 says, of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. We see in scripture that he is called the names of God. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says the mighty God, the everlasting father. In Isaiah 7, 14, he's called Emmanuel, which means God with us, proving over and over in scripture that Jesus is God. We even see that the Lord is our righteousness. So in scripture, Jesus is called the names of God. He also has the characteristics of being divine. He is eternal. In John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Colossians 1, 17 says, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus is fully God. He has the names of God. He has the divine characteristics of God being eternal. He's also omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. In Matthew 28, he says, I am with you always. We also know in Isaiah 9, 6, which I said, he is everlasting. So he is omnipresent. He is omniscient, meaning he knows all things. And John 16, 30 actually says, you know all things. He has divine characteristics. He is also all powerful. In that verse 9, 6 from Isaiah He's described with the term mighty God. He is all powerful. This is not just a baby's birthday. This is God who is all powerful, all knowing. He is omnipresent. He is eternal. He is fully God. We also see that he has throughout scripture the works attributed to him that are normally attributed to God, like creator. John 1, 3 says, all things were made through him and the world has been made through him. Jesus is creator. Jesus is the upholder of all things. In Colossians 1, 17, it says, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the upholder of all things, the sustainer. And in Matthew 9, 6, it says, the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So Jesus is able to forgive sins. So again, This is not a birthday celebration of just a baby, another man that made it to earth. This is God in the flesh who is divine, who can forgive sins, who is eternal. He is fully God. And we see that Jesus actually claimed this in his life. He claimed that he was God. We see in John 16, where he told the disciples to pray in his name. He even said in John 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. And in John 14, 7, he says that to know God is to know him, and to know him is to know God, because he and the Father are one. John 14, 7 says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Jesus is fully divine. He is fully God. So in his divine nature, John Piper continues, Jesus was fully God. In his human nature, he was fully man. In his divine nature, he had all the essential attributes of God during his incarnation. And in his human nature, he was finite and could therefore grow in wisdom and stature as it mentions in Luke 2. You see, when he was here on earth, nobody mistook him for anything except a man. He looked the part. He took on the form of a servant and looked just like mankind, but he was no ordinary man. And we see that in Matthew 8, where the question is asked, what sort of man is this, that even the winds and waves obey him? This is not an ordinary birthday. This is not an ordinary baby. This is God in the flesh, fully divine, fully God. And there's something interesting that as I was pondering these gifts that the wise men brought, 
These gifts, why are these gifts fit for a king? Well, frankincense is used in worship and it could represent his divinity. And so, of course, that gift, while it seems strange to give a baby incense, it makes sense because he is divine and he is to be worshiped. But the thing about Jesus that you have to understand is that while as a baby, he relied on other people, Jesus in his divinity is fully self-sufficient. And so the gifts that the wise men brought were not because Jesus needed all of this extra support, all of these gifts, all of these things. Jesus is God and he is self-sufficient. Acts 17, 25 says, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life, and breath, and everything. This is so important to remember because as soon as we think that we are bringing all of these things to Jesus, that we need to bring this stuff to him because he needs it and he needs us, then we start to put ourselves higher than what we really are because he alone is self-sufficient. Everything that he asks of us is supposed to be this expression of worship because we understand that he alone is God and we can't do anything on our own power to please him or help him be sustained, he is self-sufficient. So the gifts that were brought were not because the wise men are saying, well, you're gonna need this. It's because they recognized who he truly was and it was worship. We also see that Jesus is perfect love. In Deuteronomy 10, 17, it says, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. You see, these gifts were not brought to bribe Jesus into saying, here's some good stuff for you, now treat us nicely. The reason that's important to remember is because if we think we're bringing anything to Jesus as a bribe to say, if I do this, then you're gonna treat me this way, then we don't understand that God is love and that everything that we're going through, everything that he gives us, everything from a correction to blessings is an expression of his perfect love. Jesus is perfect love. That is so critical to understand because there is no need to bribe him and he won't be bribed because he is already doing the fullness of his love. He gave us Jesus Christ so that we don't have to die. What an expression of love. So Jesus is fully God. He's self-sufficient. He is perfect love. And I hope you're understanding the grandeur of who Jesus Christ is. I hope you're able to see both that yes, he came to earth in the form of a baby. But this is God himself who said, I am coming down, I'm reaching into mankind to solve a problem that no one else can fix. Man has no part in this. I'm going to use man as part of my plan, but it is because of God that any of this is happening. That is how big this idea of Christmas is. So all of these truths that I've mentioned are individually plenty for us to worship him for. But collectively, we recognize that these truths are real and they are who he is and we should be overwhelmed with awe and fear and wonder and love and those overwhelming things and and realizations should push us into worship. Expressions of our heart saying, you mean to tell me that God is the one who had a hand in all of this. He is responsible for everything. And that God came to earth so that I don't have to die and I can have eternal life. I don't have to suffer the wrath of God, a holy God who is righteous and just. You mean to tell me that it's because of Jesus? Yes, and that prompts worship. The expression of our heart is to recognize who he really is. So those things that we've, we've talked about already, that's enough to worship him. But there's one more that I want to point out. Jesus, the divine Jesus, was brought to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he came to earth so that he could fully take our sin. And as we read in Philippians 2, he became a servant. Do you understand the power that is present in the Christmas story? Do you understand that this is God who didn't have to respond in any way. Anything that he decided to do is right. There's no argument. 
This is God who said, I am going to not count this equality as something to hold on to and just sit and be God. I'm going to do something about it and I'm taking on the form of a servant. This was not Jesus coming to earth and saying, I'm going to be treated like a king on earth. This was Jesus coming to earth saying, I'm going to be killed while I'm on earth. And it was for you and me. And so the last thing I want you to realize about Jesus from this little statement in Luke, where the angel comes in verse 32 and says, he will be called great and he will be the son of the most high God. That one statement has led us into understanding the divinity of Jesus. But I want you to focus on the fact that Jesus was a servant. Fully God became a servant. John 17, 5 gives us this understanding that he was exalted. He stepped down and he's awaiting to be exalted again when it says, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Jesus is eternal. Before the world existed, he was with God. He is God. He stepped down and he put on humanity in the fullness of his deity. That's who Jesus is. Mark 10, 45 says, for even the son of man came not to serve not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, he emptied himself of the privileges associated with his position and became a servant. And this is what makes his birth so amazing and so personal. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Fully divine, fully God became man. Not as a dare, not out of obligation, not because we earned it or gave him gifts to bribe him, but because he loved us. He became a servant with the nature of man. He became reliant on an earthly mom and dad. He relied on food and water. He relied on the creation that he had a hand in creating. But with all of that reliance that he put himself in, he relied primarily and only on the power of God. You see, he put himself in position to be fully dependent on God through the Holy Spirit. I read this particular quote back when we studied the book of Philippians, and it has made such an impact to just the simple understanding of this that I want to read it again for you today. He made himself nothing. He didn't come as a king into his own creation. He put himself in the hands of a poor couple in a conquered nation, in a backwater town called Nazareth. Could anything good come out of Nazareth? He made himself nothing because deep in his being, he was taking on the essence of a servant, just as at the core of his being, of his nature, he was equal with God and was God. So now at the core of his nature, he was going to be a servant. He would get hungry and tired and feel pain. He'd understand human weaknesses and serve people anyway. He made himself nothing because deep in his being, he was going to serve. But how far would he go to serve their interests? How much of himself would he give? Those are questions that we ask ourselves. All right, I'm going to help, but I'm only going to give you this much. And I'm only going to do it under these criteria. And I really want you to thank me when I'm done, because otherwise I'm going to hold a grudge that you weren't even thankful. No. How much of himself would he give? He came and he would follow through on exactly what he came for. He would voluntarily die for sinners. He would take their sin upon himself and let it crush him instead of crush them. He would die in the most humiliating and painful way that has ever been conceived on a cross. He died because you are a sinner. He cared for you ahead of himself and he died for you and for me. That's the Jesus that we celebrate. Not the birth of just a baby. Unlike any other person or baby you have ever held or met or celebrated the life of. This is Jesus Christ. This is fully God, eternal, omniscient, all-knowing. He is God and he is Jesus. That's who we celebrate. And so you might ask, why does all of this matter for me right now at Christmas? I think you get it. But we're going to answer two things. 
I want you to remember these two truths as you celebrate, not just today and not just this Christmas, but every day of your life if Jesus is your savior. I want you to see these two things. Jesus' divinity gives us hope. His purpose was to save the lost, lost through his life, death, and resurrection. Everything that he taught is true. Everything about his power, his love, his promises, his blessings, all of it is true. We don't hope in just another baby. We don't hope in mankind. We have our hope in him, God. 2 Corinthians 4 says this, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentarily, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are, that are unseen are eternal. Christmas is going to come to an end this year. You're going to have a point in time where your gifts are done being opened. And there's going to be a point in time next year where you can't even remember what you got this year for Christmas. That's the reality. Some of you are going to sort through last year's Christmas presents because you swap out this year's and you give away the last year's. All of these things are going to come to an end. Every single one of these things are unimportant when it comes to eternity. This year, celebrate Christmas because Jesus' divinity gives you hope, and it's an eternal hope. And it's not just a hope that I wish something would happen with my eternity. It's something that you can grasp hold of because God came personal in the flesh, and he died for your sins so that you could have life. And so the second thing is that Jesus' divinity gives us life. He wasn't just another person. He wasn't just a good teacher or a good man. He is God. Through him, we don't just find solid theology or love expressed in a great way. We find perfection. We find the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus Christ, we find eternal life. John 10.10 10 says this, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Don't define your life as how many gifts you got this year or what quality they were or how much of your Amazon list is already purchased if you click and see what's already been purchased. Don't define your life by anything except Jesus Christ. He came for you so that you could have eternal life and in his divinity we have hope and we have life. So today, as we bow in prayer, I want you to thank him for the hope and the life that you have because of who he is and what he's done. As divine and man, he alone satisfied the criteria to take on the sin of the world so that we may have life and life eternal. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we acknowledge who you are. And while it's hard to comprehend how Jesus is God and man all at the same time, we know by faith that it is true. We know that this is just not another baby, another person being born. As miraculous as human life is, this is no ordinary man. This is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, God in the flesh. And so right now we celebrate the hope that we have in you. We celebrate the life that we have in you. But there may be someone here who doesn't understand that hope, who doesn't know that eternal life. Maybe there's someone here who says, there's nothing I can do to earn that. There's nothing good I've ever done. But maybe as a personal God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you are prompting that person's heart to say, get up and receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Because the truth of it is that Jesus, you knew everything about us. You know our disgusting sin. And you said, I'm going to nail it to the cross. 
I'm going to die for that sin. I'm going to be raised to life so that there is no death that the believer in Jesus Christ has to experience. And our sins are gone. Lord, during this final song, as we sing that we want to crown you with many crowns, would you bring forward that person to this altar who says, I need Jesus Christ as my savior. I've treated this as just another baby being born and how fun it is to get caught up in Christmas. Would you bring to their hearts and their minds the realization that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God, you are so loving that you sent your son to die for our sins so that we can have eternal life. Thank you for the ability to praise you. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray.